does Nick have cooties or something? I don't have anything off the top. Uh, Daphne, do you want to kick us off? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so on the attacks in Beirut and Tehran, are you concerned that this complicates the ceasefire talks? So first, to, to take a little bit of a step back, we have, of course, seen the news and the statement from Hamas, but I don't have anything additional to offer on that. And I don't want to speculate at this time about this incident or possible reactions. And we, of course, continue to be in touch with governments in the region. You all have seen um, calls from the secretary, readouts of calls that he's had with regional partners. Our priority continues to be uh, to promote diplomatic solutions for a more peaceful, secure, and integrated region, and that, of course, in includes uh, continuing to engage and work very hard to close the remaining gaps as it relates to a ceasefire in Gaza. Getting this deal done, bringing the hostages home, getting an influx of humanitarian aid, um, ending the violence in Gaza, it remains uh, incredibly important. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, speculate on any potential impacts. It continues to be a priority for the United States. Uh, we know it's a priority for regional partners. Uh, we know it's a priority for um, uh, for Israel, uh, and so we'll continue to work at it. Uh, I mean, both Qatar and Egypt, which have acted as mediators in talks, suggested that the killing of the Hamas leader in Tehran could further jeopardize efforts to secure a truce in Gaza. Do you share that concern? So, I, as I just said, I'm just not going to speculate on any impacts here. How can you move the talks forward at this point, given everything that's gone on in the past 24 hours? We spoke a little bit about this yesterday, Daphne. I'm not going to speak to the specific inner workings of the ongoing negotiation process and the effort that is uh, continuing to be uh, done underway to close these gaps and to uh, get this deal done. Um, it's something that we're going to remain focused on, but I'm not going to uh, get into more specifics beyond that. And then we reported that the U.S. was seeking to deter Israel from striking Beirut in retaliation for the attack over the weekend. Do you feel Israel has ignored your warnings? And what conversations have you had with Israel today? So uh, just to reiterate what you heard uh, the secretary say uh, in, uh, in an interview in Singapore, um, we were not involved in this um, mission or operation. And certainly, uh, I'm not going to get into specific uh, private diplomatic discussions. Uh, what I can say is that our priority uh, region-wide continues to be promoting uh, diplomatic solutions for a more peaceful and secure region. That's what we're going to continue to remain focused on. Those have been at the core tenets of the uh, conversations that the secretary has had um, in the past uh, half a day uh, in the region, continuing to talk to counterparts about uh, ways we can continue to push and, and make a ceasefire happen. And that's what we'll uh, keep focus on. Has he spoken with or will he speak with Israeli counterparts? I don't have any calls to uh, preview at this time, Daphne. As you guys have saw, he had the opportunity to speak to uh, um, his uh, counterparts in uh, Qatar as well as uh, Jordan. Um, and uh, per usual, any other call readouts that we have, we'll make sure to share those with you. Um, Olivia, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, we understand that uh, the Israelis provided a heads up ahead of the Beirut strike. Was a heads up provided to the United States ahead of the targeting of Hania? So what I can just say, Olivia, is that this is not something that we were involved in, and I'm not going to get into more specific diplomatic conversations beyond that. Okay. Um, and I know that you're not speculating about the fallout from here, but does the U.S. view at this as a step as conducive to finalizing a ceasefire deal? Again, I think that's uh, asking me to speculate on something in, a, in another way. Uh, I'm just not going to speculate on this. We are clear-eyed and focused on what the United States priorities are and what we would like to see happen, and that is a continued focus on the diplomacy. Uh, our team is continuing to work very hard to narrow and close the daps, gaps. We continue to believe a deal uh, is possible. Getting a deal done is of vital importance for so many reasons that I've spent much of this week talking about, whether it be bringing hostages home, whether it's getting an influx of humanitarian aid, uh, being able to uh, partake in diplomacy to get this cycle, this region out of endless cycles of violence. So, so for all those reasons and more, this is incredibly important and we'll remain focused on that. So without looking ahead, looking backwards, how essential had Hania been in these discussions? I mean, we know that Ultimately, Yaya Sinwar was signing off on decisions that Hamas was making, but 
how essential was Hania in the discussions to this point? So I, I'm not going to um, get into the specifics of, of that kind of, uh, of those kinds of negotiations in terms of uh, the pertinent actors and interlocutors. What I can say is through uh, appropriate channels, we have been able to continue to uh, communicate with Hamas and uh, Israel, of course, as it relates to the contours of uh, the deal and the negotiations that's on the table. And we continue to have confidence in our ability to do so and our ability to uh, participate in these talks and uh, work around the clock to get this deal done. So the Qataris have not signaled that they are no longer going to take part in these talks? I, I'm certainly not going to speak for uh, uh, another government. I've said that a couple times this week. But uh, so from the United States perspective, uh, we continue to remain laser focused on this. Um, uh, Qatar uh, has been an irreplaceable partner throughout this whole conflict, dating back to even uh, uh, October 7th and beyond, and that continues to be the case. Okay, one more, sorry, uh, the Supreme Leader of Iran uh, put out a tweet essentially saying it is our duty to take revenge. What does the United States know about possible retaliatory steps taken by Iran or its press. So I'm just not going to speculate on what the uh, Supreme Leader may or may not be referring to and don't want to speculate on the actions that the Iranian regime uh, may or may not take. Uh, we are continuing to urge restraint to all parties to avoid an escalation into a wider regional conflict. Uh, and as the Secretary uh, uh, said in Singapore, the United States uh, was not involved in the attack in Tehran, but uh, the United States, of course, will take um, every possible measure to uh, appropriately and uh, uh, accurately uh, protect our personnel, our interests um, uh, in the region and beyond uh, should we need to. What about those of the Israelis? Is there a commitment to come to Israel's defense so, later on? Uh, you've heard me say this a number of times this week, our, our commitment to uh, Israel's security and defending them from uh, uh, malign attacks like those from uh, reckless regimes like the uh, Iranian regime, that is unwavering and ironclad and that continues uh, to be the case. Israel is, of course, a country that faces a, a number of threats uh, uh, purely based on just where they are in the world. And so that uh, our, our security relationship with them is unwavering. Our commitment to them is unwavering. But again, I'm not going to speculate on um, any actions that may or may not happen. Thank you. I have one more Bidang. on Russia. We'll come back. Yeah. yeah. Go Thank ahead. Uh, just to, to follow up uh, on yeah. Olivia's question. Uh, now, you said to understand uh, clearly. Uh, you're saying that if uh, Iran responds, the U.S. will be there to defend Israel, correct? What I'm saying is that our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad, and of course part of that includes uh, the defense of Israel in uh, as it, when it faces threats from malign actors like the Ir Ir Iranian regime. That mm -hmm. is, should be no surprise to you, Saeed. So, uh, so you often speak of the rights of every nation to defend itself. Do you acknowledge that this was an Israeli aggression against Iran? I don't have any information for you, side on um, this incident or possible reactions, and certainly don't have anything uh, to offer okay. as it relates to attribution, and uh, would let the Israelis speak to um, any operation right. of theirs that, okay. uh, that that they may be undertaking. I don't have okay. a perspective well, I mean, to you know, offer from... It seems from... that the whole world uh, acknowledges that this was an Israeli aggression on the capital of Iran. But suppose, you know, when you when you develop the proper information to say that Israel was behind this aggression on the Iranian capital. It is within Iran's right to defend itself. I'm not going to speculate on uh, right. this, Saeed. I don't have an update or an assessment to offer for you as it relates to attribution. Okay. Uh, in, um, and so I will just leave it at that. Okay. In principle, as a sovereign nation, does Iran have the right to defend itself? Saeed. Uh, it's a simple question. Does Iran, as a sovereign nation, as any other nation, does it have the right to defend itself. Iran is a regime that uh, time and time again, uh, since 1979, has mm -hmm. one, been the largest and greatest exporter of terrorism, not just in the uh, Middle East, but broadly. And it has a clear track record of not just suppressing uh, its own people, but also uh, okay. funding, promoting, encouraging, um, uh, malign, destabilizing actions okay. uh, across the region. Uh, okay. And our opinion and point of view on the uh, uh, Iranian regime 
theme is quite clear, and we will not hesitate to uh, not just stand with our allies and partners when it comes to defending against threats from Iran, but also taking appropriate action from the United States okay, um, so, as, it, uh, so, as it stands. So you're saying that the nature of the Iranian regime strips it of the right to defend itself and to defend so itself. I just don't have any okay. assessment to offer on this. Okay. No, you just said um, that. The, I, I don't have any to assessment to offer on this incident. I don't have okay. any assessment on attribution. Okay. Let, or me, let me ask you something. Like you talked about the, uh, the, the deal mm -hmm. that is underway, the negotiations. Now, you know, is there any doubt that the Israeli prime minister have taken almost every step to scuttle the negotiations over the past few months? So, uh, Do you have any doubt in your mind I, I'm not that he gonna, has taken those? Steps? I'm not going to speak for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Saeed, right. and I will let him okay. speak for himself. But in general, what I can say is that we have seen the Israelis right. engaged and constructive in conversations uh, that we have been having about a ceasefire deal. And so we continue to believe both that a ceasefire deal is both achievable and urgent, and um, it is something that uh, our partners in Israel want. I'm I'm not going to speak to the specificity of the ongoing process beyond that. Okay, but Mr. Hani was the chief negotiator. He was the chief negotiator involved in these negotiations. So when Israel first kills his grandchildren, then kills all his children, then kills him, does that send like a clear message that they don't want these negotiations? He is the chief negotiator, correct? Right. I will say again, as I've said to Daphne and others, I'm not going to speculate on this as it relates to uh, how it may or may not uh, impact a, a ceasefire deal. What I can say is that the United States unequivocally uh, is focused on continuing its work to f uh, close the gaps. We think that getting a deal done is not just in the United States' interest, it's in the region's interest, it's in Israel's interest, it's in the interest of the Palestinian people. Uh, we are talking about uh, creating the conditions so the remaining hostages can return home, that there can be an influx of humanitarian mm -hmm. aid. Uh, and. Uh, getting this region out of this endless cycle of violence. So that's what we're going to remain focused on. Okay. And as I said to uh, uh, Olivia yeah. and others, when it comes to continuing to engage in these conversations, mm -hmm. uh, there continue to be ways in which we can continue to engage uh, with Hamas and Israel appropriately as it relates to the contours of the deal. And that work, I have no doubt, will continue. Okay, let me ask you, uh, you know, a basic question. As far as the negotiations are concerned, is the killing of Mr. Hani good, bad, or indifferent in your view? I am not going to speculate again for what is probably now the fifteenth time. Mm -hmm. I uh, am not going to speculate I'm on. Just saying, how uh, is it likely to impact? Again, I am right. just not going to speculate on that. What right. I can speak to is what the United States is doing and what the United States is focused on. And what we are doing and what we are focused on is working to close the gaps. We continue to believe a deal is achievable. We think it's urgent, uh, and we continue to work at this around the clock. Okay, my last. I promise. Side. I promise that okay. it's my my last. My last. Last, okay. My last. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel that killing Hani uh, complicates the negotiations further? Sorry, right. you literally just asked me I'm a version of that you, question. Is this, is this Willie, go ahead. Willie, go ahead. Willie. Very similar. Go ahead, question. Willie. Say, yeah. I mean, you mentioned that Israel, in your eyes, has shown a willingness or that it is a priority to to get a deal done. But I mean, certainly eliminating the person that you're trying to get a deal done with suggests that it's not. A priority. So look, Willie, I don't have an assessment to offer as it relates to attribution, and I'm certainly not going to speak for the Israelis or any other government or entity as it relates to this. What I can say is that the United States is squarely focused on is getting a deal done. It is the message that the secretary is carrying and the conversations that he's having with world leaders and counterparts, some of which that we just talked about. And that's what we are uh, focused on. We continue to believe a deal is achievable and urgent, and we're going to have our team continue to work to tirelessly to close those gaps. Just shifting, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in the wake of, of the Hania killing, is there any posturing or concern of embassies in the region or, or elsewhere right now, security So wise? look, I, I, I take this situation, put the situation aside for a, a second, Willie. We take the safety of all our personnel, not just state department personnel, but any personnel, American personnel, uh, incredibly seriously. We take the safety of our um, embassies and our facilities and our installations incredibly seriously. And constantly around the clock, we are always assessing circumstances on the ground. We are assessing uh, what risk uh, 
levels are, what threat levels are, and appropriately, uh, we will make adjustments uh, on those as we need to. We certainly aren't going to read out that operational process from here. That would kind of be counterproductive. But what I can say is that this is not just tantamount of importance to the Secretary of State. I know it is also of importance to not just the President, but the Secretary of Defense and other um, executives across this um, interagency who may or may not have personnel abroad. So this is something that we are paying very close attention to. Yeah, go ahead, see, Daphne. You said that you've seen Israel engage in constructive conversations about a ceasefire deal. Is it still your assessment today that they're engaging constructively? That is still our assessment. I'm not going to speak to uh, specific negotiation processes, but that continues to be uh, our assessment. Go ahead. So saying nothing about the eventual outcome of the mm -hmm. talks or progress towards a ceasefire hostage release deal, can you say if given the response from key mediators from Hamas, Will the assassination lead to at least a pause in the talk? So uh, that is not uh, our understanding at the moment. Uh, and But beyond that, I'm not going to speculate on uh, the impacts here uh, to say for also probably the 15th time. Uh, our focus is on uh, working to close this gap, the, the gaps that exist, and continuing to work to get this deal done. Uh, when we say that this is of uh, vital importance to the region, that is not hyperbole. That we uh, legitimately think that to be true, not just in the context of Israel and Gaza, but also when we are talking about destability um, across the region, we think that a ceasefire deal has the potential to be beneficial in addressing uh, uh, that situation writ large as well. Has there been any direct or indirect uh, conversations between the U.S. and Iran following the assassination? I'm not aware of any uh, diplomatic conversations. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Oh, actually, before I come to you, does anybody else have any? Yeah. Go ahead, Ruby. Yeah. I know, Alex, I'm sure you have a, a wide geography to cover, so I just want to uh, close out this region of the world before we come to you. Yeah. Follow up on the assassination of Hanien's implication on the Gaza ceasefire talks. Actually, uh, one of the mediators, Qatar, Qatar's foreign minister, Al Thani, today uh, said, I mean, asked the question, which is that uh, how can mediation succeed when one party assassinates the neg negotiator on the other side? What is your response to this? So look, uh, again, I'm not a, a spokesperson for the Qatari Foreign Ministry. Uh, I will let uh, the Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs speak to his own uh, comments. What I can say is that uh, the Secretary um, and the Prime Minister had a constructive call uh, earlier today where the Secretary reiterated again the uh, need for getting a ceasefire, for getting a ceasefire done. Uh, the Secretary reiterated the United States uh, commitment to continue continuing to work to close these gaps and to get a deal across the finish line for all the reasons that I talked about. Uh, one more, please, uh, on the Middle East. Do you have any comment on two Al Jazeera journalists, uh, Ismail and Rami, who were killed in an Israeli airstrike uh, today in northern Gaza? Uh, you know, this raises to the number of journalists and media personnel killed in Gaza to 165. What is your reaction? So we've seen those reports in our uh, tracking the details. We also have asked our uh, counterparts uh, in the region for uh, additional information uh, should they have it. Look, as the secretary himself has said, uh, we offer our deep condolences uh, to the many Palestinian journalists in Gaza uh, killed or injured during this war and for all that they are suffered. Uh, as I said, we are continuing to engage with uh, the government of Israel and the IDF on the importance of protecting journalists and all civilians during during the conflict. Um, we believe that journalists have been integral to shedding uh, a light on the dire uh, dire circumstances uh, in the Gaza Strip right now. Uh, and we have been absolutely clear that Israel has a moral obligation uh, and a strategic imperative to protect civilians. And of course, part of that includes uh, journalists. But I don't have any more as it relates to this Just a quick specific. follow up. You said yeah. you asked Israel for more information. There have been many uh, incidents uh, over the past nine months that you asked Israel to, to provide more information. Can you give us one example uh, of? I'm not going to get into the. I'm not going to get into. This? I'm not going to get into specific um, uh, diplomatic conversations. There have been a number of instances in which we have asked our partners in Israel for additional information, in w and in which they have provided it. They have shed light on the nature of those operations and how they were conducted. Uh, 
we will continue to engage with those conversations privately with our partners in Israel and publicly uh, when needed. Prem, go ahead. I will have a non-Middle East question later. If I, I'm sure you will. Prem, go ahead. Thank you, Adan. Said, 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 I understand that you are very passionate about these issues. It is not helpful for you to interrupt oh, your colleagues. I'm sorry, but I'm saying, I'm just making the I, point that this particular journalist was I actually understand. I understand. by the Israelis. I, the Israelis. I appreciate your flag, uh, but you interrupting your colleagues is not uh, productive to the daily press briefing process. Prem, Thank you, Dan. Um, so perhaps this is a, a good follow-up here. Um, it's been a 184 days now since Israeli forces killed him, their job, her family, and medics sent to save her. Last month, when myself and other colleagues asked about the investigation into this, the department said Israel Israel said that they're still investigating, and that Israel also said that the UN and Red Crescent did not respond to outreach from the Israeli government. I reached out to the Red Crescent, and they said that, no, the Israeli government did not reach out. So has the Biden-Harris administration followed up on this um, alleged, alleged lie by the Israeli government or sought to confirm any of Israel's claims on, on the half-year-old killing now of, of this girl and her family? So uh, we are in touch with our partners in Israel um, around the clock on a variety of issues. I don't have any specifics to read out as it relates to this conversation. I'm happy to check if there have been any additional updates. But to my understanding, this investigation is still ongoing. And I will leave it to them to, to speak to the details of it. So I had reached out to the Israeli government as well. And uh, while I was reaching out to the Red Crescent, and they said they would get back to me with an answer. And that did not after we reported the Red Crescent said that is like well, it's really, I, I'm not a I'm spokesperson for no, the right, responsiveness of, of a, just another foreign given ministry. Given that, you know, uh, this government gives them billions of dollars in aid, I imagine that such claims want to be fact-checked. So uh, we will continue to engage with our partners in Israel. We ask them for additional information. We ask questions when we see incidents unfold, uh, and we'll continue to do that. As it relates to this incident, I'm not aware of any updates, and I believe this investigation is ongoing. OK, and one, one, one yeah. quick one. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, with the 2024 election around the corner, um, how has the US followed up on, on the reporting, um, I believe a month and a half ago-ish, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, of Israeli government-sponsored influence campaigns attempting to influence American politics. So uh, I'm not uh, aware of uh, I'm not aware of this report specifically. The, the, New, York reporting, the New York Times reporting. The New York Times reporting. Right. Sorry. No, sorry. Yes. No, no. I understand That's what you're speaking to. Um, yeah. So look. Uh, any foreign um, entity is aware of U.S. laws and the confines in which um, they should or should not be allowed to operate within the United States. When it comes to uh, disinformation and uh, things targeted at the United States, I will say that that is uh, not necessarily something that lives in, in this department. And I'm happy, I'm sure my colleagues at the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security would be happy to talk to you about efforts that are underway as it relates to election integrity um, and and things like that, including the office of the ODNI. Are there any other nations um, who receive billions of dollars from the United States that are alleged to conduct such foreign influence campaigns? So I'm just not going to speculate on what was uh, a non-government assessment report cited in that reporting, but I'm happy. I am sure that these other entities who deal on this very important issue would be happy to speak to you in greater detail. Go ahead. Uh so I know you said that you wouldn't comment on, on the impact of Hania, but mm -hmm. the U.S. government had a $5 million reward on the head of Fuad Shukr. Um, I was just wondering if you had any comment on, on his killing. and, and So first, uh, we spoke a little bit about this um, earlier in the week. Um, we've seen some conflicting reports on whether uh, food shokers survived uh, the strike, but the latest information out of Beirut suggests that he did uh, succumb to his injuries after uh, being taken to a hospital for treatment. Uh, let's also remember that this was an individual who was involved in the 1983 U.S. Marine barracks bombing and certainly has uh, American blood on his hands. Uh, and as it relates to our rewards for justice program, I just don't have any additional information. Confidentiality is a key aspect of the way in which the department's reward for justice program operates. Uh, and as a rule, we don't publicly disclose uh, specific information submitted into uh, responses as it relates to things like this. Uh, but I think an important thing to note, uh, again, is that um, the US was not involved in the planning of the attack. And this was an uh, action taken by the IDF based on uh, Israeli intelligence. Uh, let's DR, go ahead. Thank you. You, you just said that the U.S. is not involved in this uh, act, but the Iranian government sent a letter to the United Nations Security Council, and they clearly says that 
the U.S. Uh, has the resp responsibility for that act, which they say that this act could not have occurred without the authorization and intelligence support of the United States. W what's your comment on this? So again, I just don't have any assessment to offer for you as it relates to attribution and our message to any uh, country, to any entity, whether it be uh, the Iranian regime or otherwise, is the call for de-escalation and to not take any actions that would lead the region into wider conflict. That has been our message since October 7th, and that uh, continues to be the case. And then yesterday, the, the U.S.-led global coalition attacked PMF, the Iranian backed group, is in Iraq. So, so and, and then the Iraqi government condemned this, and they said that despite all the efforts through political and diplomatic channels, and that the U.S.-led global coalition, they attacked the PMF, and they want to drag Iraq into the wider conflict in the region. So, so why did why did you why did you conduct this attack and what's your comments on the Iraqi let's, government? Let's be a little bit clear about what this is, is that U.S. forces carried out a defensive airstrike in Iraq on July 30th. These actions were taken to address an imminent threat posed to U.S. and coalition forces. Uh, and we have a commitment to the safety and security of our personnel and we won't hesitate to defend our people or hold responsible those who uh, may potentially harm U.S. personnel. And it's as uh, simple as that. Uh, and go ahead in the back. Well, thank you. Always in the same uh, Middle East issues. I want to bring you back to Al Jazeera, please. Uh, Al Jazeera, the network now assures you, confirms that it was a targeted killing. Uh, the, the, t the crew of reporters were reporting by the house of Hania, and they've been struck by that missile. Uh, what would you have to say? We know you're talking to the Israelis, but what are you specifically asking them? You have 22 Arab countries who need an answer. So I don't uh, have any updates as it relates to this particular circumstance. As I said to your colleague, uh, we are aware of these reports and we have uh, uh, communicated with our partners in Israel for more additional information, but I don't have anything to share beyond that at the moment. Uh, okay, Alex, go ahead. Yes, I... On Georgia, uh, uh -huh. uh, statement the secretary put out. Yeah. Uh, um, he was referring to the compre comprehensive review of the bilateral relationship, and yep. he said that today's action is a result of uh, that review. Does that mean that you guys have concluded the review? Have you landed into conclusion? And if, that's, if, if so, should we view today's action as an isolated action, or is it part of a little of one of the little steps you are willing to take. Let me um, widen the aperture a little bit, Alex, because I'm not sure um, others in your uh, uh, others in the room may be tracking. So uh, earlier this morning, the secretary announced that the United States will pause $95 million in assistance that would have benefited the government of Georgia. Uh, the U.S. is taking this step due to the Georgian government's recent anti-democratic actions and false statements that are uh, incompatible with membership norms both in the European Union and NATO. Uh, let's remember that nearly 80% of the Georgian people support EU membership, uh, but the Georgian government, through its own actions, including this spreading of disinformation about its allies and partners, is moving the country further uh, from European aspirations of its citizens. Uh, we'll continue to urge the Georgian government to return to the path of democracy and Euro-Atlantic integration by repealing the foreign influence law, uh, withdrawing other problematic legislation ending its disinformation campaign and committing to conduct the elections and pre-election season transparently and allowing international and domestic monitors. These actions would be consistent with receiving support from the United States as a democratic partner. Uh, though our uh, bilateral ties are at a uniquely challenging moment, the United States commitment to the Georgian people and their uh, aspirations is as absolutely enduring. We will continue to support programs and activities that benefit the people of Georgia by strengthening democracy, rule of law, independent media, and economic uh, development. Um, as you, this review, Alex, that you asked about at the beginning, that review is ongoing, and um, we, of course, uh, stand at the ready to take any additional and appropriate actions should we need to. On, on the line that the secretary is drawing to make a distinction between the funding was supposed to go to the Georgian government, although I'm surprised that they, are, they had an access given everything they had done, and the funding that you available is still available for Georgian people, uh, is that a reflection of uh, you know the you know, Georgian government when you announced its actions previously? They're pushing propaganda, saying that because of ambiguity behind the sanction, saying that you were targeting the Georgian people. Is that a reflection of your message that you're not? You're not. This is uh, distinctly about Georgian government. 
uh, th Alex, this uh, uh, the assistance programs uh, that benefit the Georgian Dream government will be paused while we continue to assess the broader bilateral relationship. In some cases, assistance programs may be modified to redirect resources to non-government entities working within a particular sector. Thank you. You also probably have seen the Helsinki Commission leaders' letter to the secretary from uh, July 26, in which they are asking for sanctions against Ivan Shvili and his uh, inner circle. Is any any? No. Certainly, would not preview any actions from up here, Alex. I want uh, Ukraine, if I may, okay. I'm in a position to confirm the reports that Ukraine has received F-60s. Uh, uh, I don't have any uh, assessment to offer on that, Alex. I'd uh, let my colleagues at the Pentagon to speak to that. I think I'm fine about Hungary, if I may. Uh -huh. the, the leadership, they have been, you know, we have seen some little actions coming from Hungary, but uh, the latest uh, action they have taken, you know, to allow Russian and Belarusian citizens without any screening to enter the European territory. Uh, is there any concern on your end that Ukraine, uh, Hungary might become a part of hybrid warfare uh, against the West? West so look, Alex, I think it's important to remember two things here. First, um, when it comes to the context, when it comes to the conflict in Ukraine um, and the very serious issues that we have with the Russian government, uh, our issue and our problem and the uh, conduct that we are seeing in Ukraine, it is not a reflection of the Russian people. It is a reflection of the uh, Russian government. And the same could be said about uh, Belarus. So I will uh, let Hungary um, speak to any uh, border or migration action that they might be taking as it relates to their own border. But uh, the United States, uh, I can say uh, unequivocally, uh, is not at odds with the people of Belarus or the people of Russia. Our issue is with the actions of it of those governments and specifically with Russia the um, barbaric aggressive um, illegal and um, uh, inconsistent with international law aggression that we are seeing as they infringe on Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty that's what this is about it is not about uh, uh, we certainly don't want to see um, uh, 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 adverse impact to the Russian people or the Belarusian people and uh, beyond that Hungary continues to be a uh, uh, a NATO ally of ours, and they continue to play a, uh, a crucial role uh, in the alliance. Thank Go you. ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, can I, she had, a, I had something on Russia, so I'm just going to, I will come back to you. Go yeah, ahead. I just wanted to ask you yeah. about public reports of political prisoners in Russia being moved around, some locations unknown. Vladimir Kar Mirza, I understand his location is unknown. Does the U.S. have any information about whether these movements are happening or why they're happening? I don't want to speculate on any reasoning. What I can say is that the United States continues to be focused on working around the clock uh, to work to get our um, wrongfully detained American citizens home, and that uh, continues to be the case. But I have no updates beyond that. Does the US know where its detainees are? So we continue to be in touch appropriately uh, with uh, uh, Russian authorities in the case of Russia about consular access and specific uh, location, but I don't have any evidence for you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, Saki from Voice of America. So uh, it's been two weeks since two uh, American journalists, uh, Evan Gershkovich and uh, also Kormysheva, have been convicted. And uh, does State Department know where they're currently being held and Kormysheva also uh, asked for a consular access. Has she been granted a consular access after her conviction? So I, Olivia just asked a version of that question, yeah. so I will point to, you to what I just yeah. said 60 seconds ago. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Just to quickly clarify what's been said on these articles. So you are confident that as we speak, the deal is still possible, even if the leader of, political leader of Hamas we continue to believe a, We continue to believe a deal is uh, achievable and urgent, and we are continuing to work and are committed to work um, to, to narrow those gaps and to make a deal possible. We think it's vital and vitally interest to the region. And is it even if the even if Hania is that who's been representing Hamas response and interest to that? So the I'm just not going to speculate. One, I'm not going to specu speculate on any impacts here. Two, I'm not going to get into uh, the negotiation process or when it comes to relevant actors or things like that. What I can say is that we have uh, the ability to appropriately and uh, successfully engage with both uh, Hamas and Israel and continue to keep this process and uh, keep the conversation ongoing. And we'll, we uh, fully intend to do that. Thank you. Jackson, go ahead. Uh, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> with Hamas, Hezbollah uh, vowing retaliation, what's the U.S. position on how Israel should respond? Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu just said that Israel, um, quote, will exact a heavy price from any aggression against us on any front, end quote. 
Are you? What are you referring to specifically, Jackson? Um, what I'm referring to is retaliation for um, Hania's death, you know, for, for you know, Hamas, and then um, uh, Hezbollah Shakir's death. So the what I can do. say, Jackson, and I will reiterate what I've said at the beginning, is that our yeah. priority region-wide is to promote diplomatic solutions for a more peaceful, secure, and integrated region, and that uh, continues uh, to be the case. And then reportedly IRGC Aerospace Force its commander Amir Ali Hajizadeh um, has been killed near Damascus. Can you confirm that? Uh, I don't have any updates uh, for you on that. No. Uh, Goyle, go thank ahead. You. Uh, thank you, sir. Two questions, please. One, uh, as far as Iran supporting terrorists is concerned, who is supporting Iran? Is it uh, Russia, China, or North Korea, or any other country supporting Iran? And second, sir, does Iran support this deal between Israel and Hamas? I can't imagine that the Iranian regime supports a ceasefire deal, uh, given that they uh, are the sowers of uh, much of the instability that we see in the region. But of course, I don't not want to speak for uh, the Iranian regime. And one. Um, there is a clear track record of the closeness of relations between uh, Russia and uh, the Iranian regime. We've seen that play out uh, in a number of ways uh, over the past uh, two years, specifically, including in the context of Ukraine. We've seen uh, the provision of uh, UAVs and uh, UAVs and other uh, security articles. Uh, and so certainly that is a relationship that's deeply concerning and one that we'll be paying close attention to. Second, sir, just a diplomatic question. Ever since uh, Vice President Kamala Harris was uh, uh, supported and endorsed by President Biden, and there have been name callings uh, against her for her, her ethnicity, color, and where she come from, and all those things. Is Secretary hearing anything diplomatically from around the globe, those secretaries or foreign ministers, uh, about uh, because being a first woman now, maybe, and also because of her look? and among others. So um, I, for a variety of reasons, many of which you've heard us talk about before, I'm, I'm certainly not going to get into electioneering or uh, campaigns from up here, but I, I will point you back to what uh, Secretary Blinken said about the vice president last week when he was asked a, a question about one of your colleagues. Um, she is somebody who, uh, on the foreign policy stage, um, has uh, spoken forcefully on behalf of the United States uh, when uh, she meets with world leaders, when she engages with them. The secretary has been able to be part of some of those engagements. Uh, world leaders and counterparts know that she not only speaks for the president, but she speaks for uh, the United States. Why well, I said it quickly, I'm sorry to uh -huh. interrupt you. Because my community is very much disturbed because my community, uh, she comes from background from India. Mm -hmm. And my community is also worried about because there are some attacks against my community here in the region well, or look, around the U.S. Let, let's just be, let's certainly be unequivocal. Any kind of derogatory remarks that are rooted in someone's uh, appearance or ethnicity or background, uh, not only are they uncalled for, they have really have uh, no place uh, in our uh, American democracy uh, discourse. But again, I I, I'm not going to get into politics or campaigning from here and would just echo what uh, the secretary has said uh, just last week about being able to work with the vice president for the past three and a half years on the world stage, engaging foreign leaders with her uh, and what she's been able to bring to the table when it comes to uh, the foreign policy accomplishments of this administration. Thank you very much. Nick, sir. you've had your hand uh, up. Venezuela. Sure, go ahead. Uh, the Colombian president is now calling on Maduro to release detailed vote counts. Do you believe that that kind of increased pressure is going to result in anything substantive, or do you think there's anything more the U.S. can do? So, look, the, over since uh, Monday, you have continued to see more and more countries echo the same call from the United States that uh, we uh, would like to see a uh, public uh, publishment of the tabulation data. Um, uh, the international community, the United States included, is uh, running out of patience on waiting for Venezuelan electoral authorities to come clean and release a full uh, detailed data um, on this election so that everyone can see the results. Um, a number of independent observers earlier uh, have released a report and stated that uh, Venezuela's 2024 uh, presidential election did not meet international standards of electoral integrity and cannot be considered democratic. So uh, 
my understanding is that the uh, OAS is going to hold a meeting later today to address some of this. I'm not going to get ahead of that meeting, but uh, I will just reiterate what I have said um, uh, almost on a consistent basis this week is that uh, the international community uh, is, is running out of patience. We are waiting, um, and there is a clear action that the Venezuelan Electoral Commission can take, and that is a uh, full detailed uh, publish uh, publication of this election data. Um, Doc, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Doc. This is on Lithuania and, and uh, elsewhere uh, mm -hmm. worldwide on anti-Semitism issues. But what is the Biden administration's response to the Lithuania government's plan to desecrate the Jewish cemetery in Vilnius, Lithuania? Just received uh, an email from the Lithuanian ambassador to uh, the U.S. saying that it plans to build a museum over the graves of Jewish people there. It's in violation of Jewish law and viewed it as an act of anti-Semitism. No follow-up. So I'm not uh, tracking or aware of that I incident specifically. So I'm I, I honestly would refer you to Lithuanian authorities. Okay. On, on another issue is um, it, it worldwide. How is the Biden administration holding other uh, countries as well as U.S. citizens accountable for anti-Semitic behavior? Uh, throughout the course of this administration, and again, I think this is something that my colleagues at the White House can um, speak a great deal about, uh, we have uh, not been hesitant to call out um, anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic insults or activities when we have seen it. Uh, certainly, uh, it has no place um, in the discourse of our country. Uh, we've spoken about this a number of times, including as recently when we have seen, uh, as part of some of the protests around the country, very clear and vile um, anti-Semitic language as part of some of the signage and um, public material that some of these protesters have used. And so uh, not only would we condemn that, that has no place um, in our uh, society. Along Robin, with that, I was going to just, just follow up the issue um, what you just talked about, holding the college campuses responsible, the universities responsible for anti-Semitism. Uh, can, the, can the Biden administration do anything? to hold the universities accountable on this matter and not let them get away with it. So uh, I appreciate your question, but uh, respectfully, this is not really a uh, foreign policy issue. And I am sure that my colleagues at the Department of Education at the White House would be happy to speak to you about this at a greater deal. What I can say unequivocally is that um, any kind of language that is derogatory, that is rooted in anti-Semitism, that is rooted in Islamophobia, that is targeting of individuals purely just because of their background, certainly has no place um, in our society. Rabia, go Thank ahead. So yeah. uh, on Turkish-Armenian normalization talks, yesterday Turkish-Armenian uh, special representatives met at, at their, uh, you know, long closed uh, border for the fifth round of talks to normalize their relations. Do you have any comment on that, both on the meeting and the, you know, normalization? I don't. I would leave it to the two respective countries to, to speak to that. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Vedan. Just to make sure that I have understood, uh, you said a moment ago, that the, the U.S. forces, whether or not behind the attack on uh, popular mobilization forces in Iraq and uh, what that was carried out yesterday. Uh, what do you have for the uh, comments from Iraqi government leaders that condemn any attack on Iraq? So what I said to DR in response to his question was that the U.S. forces carried out a defensive airstrike in Iraq on July 30th. These actions were taken to address imminent threats posed to U.S. and coalition forces, and we have a commitment to the safety and security of our personnel, and we will not hesitate to defend our people uh, or hold responsible all who harm our U.S. personnel. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.